All right, welcome to class. It is Monday, it is week four, CS 106X. Uh, we have already finished three out of our 10 weeks. We're just flying through this stuff. Uh, last week we did recursion, right? And this week we are going to do more recursion. We're gonna do a particular application of recursion called backtracking. And uh, more internal errors. I don't know why, every time I start up for the day I get these errors. Um, oh well. Um, Backtracking. So, I mean, we're going to spend a whole week on this, basically. And it's a particular way of using recursion to solve certain kinds of problems that involve exploring solutions that might be right or might be wrong. And if you find a wrong solution, you backtrack and go a different path in the algorithm. So, it's a certain category of problems we can solve that way. Um, you know, if you're handling the recursion so far pretty well, then maybe you'll handle this just fine, too. But I will say, that when I was learning this material as a young lad many, many, many years ago, I found backtracking pretty tricky, even though recursion finally clicked for me at some point. Backtracking, again, took a while for, for it to click. I also see this a lot from my students. I see students who are sailing along just fine, and somehow this week, bam, they hit a brick wall. Like, I don't get it. It's backtracking stuff. I don't, I don't see how to solve these problems. So anyway, this stuff is tough. That's why we're going to spend a lot of time practicing it. Um, homework four which will go out on Friday, we'll focus on backtracking. We'll be solving a bunch of backtracking problems. I know you're probably getting sick of all these massive assignments every Friday, so the small amount of good news is that the Friday after this one, there won't be an assignment given out. But that's because there's a midterm the modification. <laughs> so, <laughs> look, it doesn't get any easier around here. You all stayed. You could have dropped last Friday, but you did it. So now you're screwed, aren't you? Um, yeah, anyway, so we're doing backtracking this week. So let's, let's go get into it. Uh, as with recursion, look, I really think you don't get better at this until you practice it. So uh, if you're watching the lectures and it makes sense and the solutions make sense to you, that's great. That's a good start. But I, I offer you the challenge. Go solve some problems with a blank screen. See if you can do it when you don't have any uh, assistance from the room to help answer the question. So, okay, let's jump into it. If you want to read more, uh, it comes mostly from chapter 9 of the book, although some of it's also in chapter 8. So I want to start with something called an exhaustive search, which is a form of backtracking that will, bless you, that will lead us into the rest of the week. Okay, what's an exhaustive search? Well, it's when you have a set of choices or values that you want to um, process or, or list or examine or pro something, and you, uh, you explore every single one of them, all of them. Now, there's lots of ways you can implement an exhaustive search. Sometimes you can do it using a loop or something. If what you're searching is a simple thing, like I want to search this vector. You just write a for loop, loops over the vector. That's pretty simple because you're searching over something linear. But if you're searching over something more complicated than that, maybe just a loop isn't quite easy enough to, to solve it. Um, you know, like for example, we wrote that directory crawler program, right? We just print all the files in all the directories. That You could refer to that as like an exhaustive search of a directory tree. And since that structure is not linear, it's nested hierarchical, has a more complicated structure, the recursion was actually helpful for implementing that search over that space. Um, when would you do this? Well, I just mentioned the directory crawler. Uh, you know, permuting or, or searching for combinations of a set of values, it's good for that. It's good for, you know, logic, combinatorics, names, passwords. Like if you, if you want to write a dictionary attack that tries all the passwords to see which one's the right password, uh, this is the sort of thing you want. You want to exhaustively search all of the possible passwords until you find the right one. Um, so uh, these problems can be tricky to, to solve or to come up with a system for solving. So I'm going to talk a lot about certain terms like, I'm going to talk about choosing choices and stuff. Um, because, you know, when we write recursive code, remember that we have a series of calls, right? And each call does a small amount of the work towards solving a large problem. That's still going to be true here. And so I think when I talk about the calls, uh, when I'm solving these problems, I'm going to say that each call makes a choice. And the next call makes a successive choice. And we make a sequence of choices in a sequence of calls. Eventually, the sum of all those choices is part of our search space. And we look at that set of choices, or we print it, or whatever. Like, we, we do something with the sequence of choices made by the sequence of recursive calls that we're making. So um, let's look at some examples. Actually, sorry, let's look at pseudocode before I look at my example. Um, I would say this is kind of the general pseudocode for like how to write a, an exhaustive search algorithm. You're, you're writing some kind of function 
I just call it search, and it's getting some kind of parameter that represents a set of decisions that you need to make. What does that mean? It's super vague, but maybe it means uh, I've got a set of playing cards and I have to pick all the five card hands or something in a, in a set of cards, deck of cards. Or maybe it's a set of um, letters and I'm searching for all the passwords or something like that. So the algorithm here is if there are any decisions that are left to be made, then let's have my call make one choice. I will choose something and then I will search what could follow after this choice. Now I've got this kind of for each thing here. I guess what I'm trying to say is each call makes one choice, but it needs to explore all the possible single choices it could make. So like for example, if you're trying to print out all the five card hands you could have in a card game, well, some of those cards start with some of those five card hands start with the ace of clubs. So maybe my call grabs the ace of clubs and says, okay, that's my card. I chose that. And now I'm going to recursively pick the other four cards. Now, once I'm done with that recursion, I have theoretically enumerated or examined all of the five card hands that contain the, the, the ace of clubs or whatever card I said. But now I'm not done. Now I need to try the two of clubs. Now after I'm finished with me trying the ace of clubs, now I try the two of clubs and I tell the recursion to explore the rest. And so it's not just that I pick and then I do recursion. It's that for each thing I could pick, I try picking it and then I do a recursive traversal to follow that. And then when that comes back, I try the next thing. Try, explore, try, explore, try, explore. Um, a little vague, a little hard to follow, but it'll make more sense when we look at some problems. So, okay, what's this to do with recursion? Well, I mean, these calls where you say search the choices that could follow, those are meant to be recursive calls, right? And also, we know that in recursion, we always have a base case. That's still true here. Because if there aren't any decisions left to be made, like maybe we're trying to pick all the five card hands, if we've already picked five cards and we get to this call, then we should stop. Maybe stop means print the hand that we've been picking, or maybe stop means uh, exit the program. I don't know. It means something. We've, we've picked enough stuff here. So that ends up being like a base case for this. Now, I will mention that the base case here has a little bit of a different meaning. I mean, when I talked about base cases last week, we talked about like the base case is a simple version of the problem that's easy to solve. You just return an answer immediately or you print something immediately. You just know what to do without making any recursive calls. And in the case of these problems, I don't think of the base case that same way. I think of it as like each call is making a choice, making a choice, making a choice. The base case isn't that there are never choices to begin with. It's that I've made all the choices that I need to make. I've, I've built a stack of sufficient height that I don't need to build it any taller. And now I present what I've built. That's my base case. So again, it's not that I'm solving a simple version of the problem. It's that the previous calls did the work already. And now you get to me. And there's no more work left for me to do. So I just print something or return something or whatever. So again, base case, slightly different way of thinking of it. In fact, when I write these problems, I often do the base case last because like, I can kind of picture the, the work of the recursive calls first before I get to the, the end, the base case. Okay? So anyway, uh, it's all kind of vague. I'm trying to give you a system here. So let's look at a specific problem. Let's write a function called print binary that prints all of the binary numbers with a certain number of digits, you know, zeros and ones, right? You can do this one on step-by-step -step or on Qt Creator with the zip on the lecture page if you want. Um, okay, so at first glance, this might not look like you need to use recursion at all. And okay, fine, you, you technically don't, but, but like, you might say, oh, just do a loop up to like two to the this power and just print every int or you know, something like that. Um, yeah, okay, I mean, look, there are ways of, of solving this without recursive backtracking, but you know, look, what if you want to play my game here and you have to do it recursively, you're not allowed to use loops. How do you do it? Well, print binary two, print all the numbers with two binary digits. Seems like I print them in descending order here, right? So, okay, Let, well, let's think about it. Let's, let's go to the, um, the cute creator. I've got print binary right here. There it is. Um, okay. Well, so if I'm printing all the two-digit binary numbers, I print 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1. 
well, maybe we could use our, our old way of thinking about recursion for a minute. We could start with the base case, like what are binary numbers that are easy to print? Zero digits, okay. Um, so like if digits equals zero, lol, I don't have to do anything. Um, are there any other binary numbers that are kind of easy to print? Like one digit binary numbers, that would just print a zero on a line and then a one on a line. So okay, well I could do that. Well else if digits is one, see out zero and all, uh, see out, bless you, one and all. Okay, that's pretty easy, else, so I guess I'm gonna assume, I'm not gonna worry about negative numbers, I could throw an exception, I'll, I'll do that later. So else I'm gonna assume digits is greater than one, it's greater <laughs> than or equal to two. So, okay each recursive call doing a little bit of the work. Like what's a little bit of the work if I print a two digit or three digit binary number? What is the unit of doing some work here? A digit, okay. And how is this problem self similar? If you look at the two one versus you look at the three one, where's the self similarity? So if you look at this, that output from print binary two, it appears right there, doesn't it? And it also appears right there, right? So, I mean, it seems like the sort of idea here is to print binary, I should print a zero followed by a recursive call, and then I should print a one followed by a recursive call, sort of, right? That's kind of the, the idea here, okay. Oh gosh, is my Slack running? I thought I closed that. Hey Slack, go away. Where are you? Oh, you like my puppies? Oh. Now how do I close that? I don't even have Slack running. Is it because of Chrome? Huh. Oh well, hopefully, hopefully they don't pop up like, man, Joe's program sucks, oh my gosh. I have received uncomfortable notifications during lectures before. Uh, well, we'll never speak of that. Uh, so kind of print a zero followed by the, the rest and then print a one followed by the rest. Right, that's kind of what we were saying. Okay, so, so maybe something more like, uh, let's do like C out zero and then do print binary of digits minus one. Or maybe I don't want it to drop the line so I'll do like that or something. And then I'll do C out a one and print binary, just right? Like the, the previous one with a zero in front of it and the previous one with a one in front of something like that. Okay, I could try it. Um, and then it does what? Print binary, well that, huh. <laughs> yeah, he's right, the birthday boy's got it. Um, <laughs> He said that our code just prints a single zero and then makes a recursive call. So it like prints this zero and then it tries to do that. So but really that would just put like a zero on this first line here, you know what I mean? What you said is absolutely right, which is I want to do this but with an additional zero in front of it. We saw something like that before, right, with indentation of a directory crawler. How did we make it so the previous call could pass something to print in front of the next Call. What do we do for that? Yes? You have to, you have to add an extra parameter like called prefix or something. Yeah, let's add another parameter to the function to pass along that zero or that one. Uh, what I often hear from students, you said, you said the right answer, which is maybe pass like a, a prefix string or something. A lot of times when I show this in 106b, what they say is, well, you should pass that zero as an int parameter so you can print it in front of here. And that's not a bad idea. It's just that I think what you're going to find is that you know, if this guy passes a zero to this guy, then this guy's going to want to pass a zero to print binary of one or whatever. So I think you're going to end up having multiple characters that are being passed along here. So I think what you want is you want to say uh, string prefix. And actually, if I go up to the heading of this, maybe what you want me to do is say, um, string prefix equals nothing to start with maybe, just begin with no prefix. So I think what we're gonna do with this parameter here is it's gonna store all the binary digits that we need to place in front of our call. So like 
if I'm print binary two and I got called by print binary three at this moment, then he's gonna pass me a zero as the string zero. And then after I run me all the way to completion and return to him, he's gonna call me again, but he's gonna pass me a string of a one. And I'm gonna print the one followed by me. And so again, why does it need to be a string instead of an int? Well, because when I recursively call print binary one, I'm gonna pass his zero plus my zero and his zero plus my one and then so forth. So I have to grow this thing basically. So um, I think what I'm gonna do here is if it's a one digit number, okay, so, so what I really wanna do is I wanna call digits minus one with a zero, digits minus one with a one. There's a couple things wrong with this code but it's getting closer. It should be prefix plus zero prefix. That's really important. I don't know if you see that distinction, but it's like the previous call sent a prefix to me. I want to take this and put that on the prefix as well. Because if there's four calls prior to me with ones and zeros in there, I want my choice to be a fifth binary digit at the end of that. OK, we're getting close. <coughs> we're almost done. So. <clears throat> It's still not quite right. I mean, I can run it if you want. Uh, <laughs> what? It's worse. All of your ideas are terrible. <laughs> that was really close. Um, what's? Yeah, the whole point of building this prefix is that it gets printed in front of something. We're never printing it anywhere, right? Um, where should we print it? Like, like here. Hmm. I think we might want to redo our base cases here. So look, again, I want you to rethink what these different cases mean and what our code is really doing. I talked about choosing and exploring follow-on choices. So what's really happening here is that this thing is like a collection of choices that you've made along the way on your recursive calls. I'm storing them as a string, but that's just an implementation detail. It's a set of zeros and ones that I'm choosing in a certain order of calls. And now I get to this call. This could be the first call or it could be the 10th call. Those previous calls put some characters into that string there, okay? And those represent the choices made by those calls. I, my call, also needs to make a choice. And it does that by this, I choose zero. This single line is sort of choosing and exploring. It's saying choose a zero and then print what could follow that zero. Now when that's finished running, when that comes back to here, choose a one and try all the binary stuff that could follow that, okay? Eventually, all these calls have finished choosing. There's no choosing left to do. And when that's the case, this string stores all of the choices made all the way along that process. How do I know when there's no choices left to be made? When the digits is zero. So I want you to rethink what this parameter means. I know it means if you pass three, then print all the three digit binary numbers. But in the terms of our code, it sort of means how many more digits need to be chosen to put in here right now? How many more are left to choose? So if I say digit zero, lol, I don't have to do anything, that's not the right way of thinking of it. It's not that the person in main asked me to print zero digits. It's that they asked me to print four digits, which asked myself to print three, which asked myself to print two, which asked myself to print one, which asked myself to print zero. The answer isn't to do nothing. It's to respond to all the things the previous guys did. How do I answer what they did? I should print what they did, right? If there's nothing left to choose, print what you chose. That prefix is the entirety of what should be printed at this point, because the prefix is three characters long if I was doing print binary of three. Whatever the value of digits is, that's what I've got. Now, I don't even need this, right? This is not actually a useful case. Actually, it's a bro broken uh, uh, a bug case. We, we had it before, but we, was, uh, we thought we needed it, but uh, I guess we don't. So let's try that. Whoa, it works. It's amazing. Um, so that is pretty different than most of the other recursive code we did. It's still really short. It's deceptively simple looking. But 
the thought process of what the paces mean and how the calls communicate with each other is totally different than what we were doing most of last week. Okay? So I call this an exhaustive search of the binary space of three-digit numbers, essentially. Now, if you're having a little bit of trouble picturing what all is happening with these calls, I can use my magic again, um, and I can call this recursion.h thing. Remember that? Uh, include recursion.h. Uh, and here, I can just, at the start of each call, I think you should do this whether you use recursion.h or not. If you're trying to learn about recursion, just say cout uh, print binary uh, digits. How about I'll say digits equals, and then I'll say uh, comma prefix equals plus prefix end all. Okay, let's watch the calls. So what does it do? Oh wait, it didn't do the, sorry, 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 sorry. Uh, it, I didn't do the, um, what is it called, recursion indent. That's what I meant to do. Uh, that's why I imported recursion.h, recursion indent there. Uh, that'll make the calls tab over. Okay, let's try now. So print binary of three says I'll print all the three digit numbers that start with nothing. Okay, well then first I'll try two digit numbers that start with zero, and later I'm gonna try two digit numbers that start with one, right? Those are my two calls. The two digit numbers that start with, uh, with a zero, try all the one digit numbers that start with a zero, zero, and all the one digit numbers that start with a zero, one. Those are his two calls. And each of those makes a call with zero digits left with a zero and one, and those each lead to an output because those are base cases. So the left aligned lines are the output, the C outlines of our code, and all these indented lines are the calls. So you can see the prefix growing and growing, and when it gets all the way big, you get to the base case and you print it out. So that's, that's what our code is doing. Okay? Does that make sense? Do you guys have questions about that code? No? Okay. Uh, well, if you understand that code, <laughs> then why don't we try a, sim a variation of this? Let's try one called print decimal. So where is that? Oh, sorry, I guess I'll show you this picture before I do print decimal, which is like, we talk about a tree of calls. You kind of saw that sideways just a minute ago. Now I'm drawing it vertically. Um, so I called it so far instead of prefix, but your word prefix is great too. Um, so it's just like what I've chosen so far or what my prefix is or whatever. And uh, this is a, a tree of the two digit binary numbers. But a lot of these algorithms have this idea to them, a, a tree of different paths to explore <coughs> that might lead to answers to print out or something. Okay. So let's do print decimal, which means print all the base 10 numbers. So it's basically exactly the same code as print binary, except it's base 10 instead of base 2, right? <laughs> Use recursion. Um, OK. Well, uh, let's, go, let's go look at Qt Creator. So here's print decimal. I mean, I guess I could just do what we did for print binary, right? I mean, I could, I could go back up here and say, Actually, I want a string prefix to be a parameter here. As long as it's optional, I can do that. And then I'll go down to it. And then I have to write string prefix. I guess I could just go copy and paste. I love copying my, my own code. Um, so I could just change this to say print decimal. Wow, this one's easier than I thought. OK. Um, so now, but that's still printing binary numbers. Now what do I do? Oh, okay. I could just go. <laughs> my, my eyes, the goggles do nothing. Um, yeah, right. So I mean, I think that's the correct solution. <laughs> but I think the section leaders wouldn't give me full style points for that. <laughs> so I heard somebody say loop. Is that what you have in mind? Yeah? Uh, yeah, you could do a for loop, like for int i equals 0, i less than 9. For int i equals 0 through 9, i plus plus. Uh oh, that looks like loops, though. Uh, print prefix plus i. Uh, you have to do, you have to say string to integer i, but that's OK. Uh, OK, sure, sure, we could do that. Or no, 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 integer to, st yeah. <laughs> Integer to string. Thank you. Uh, to use that function, I think I have to say include uh, 
I think it's in Sterlib. I think that's where that function is. Okay, fine. We can try that. Um, let's go to main and let's uncomment the call to that. Oh man, five-digit numbers. That's too many. Uh, let's do all the three-digit decimal numbers. Wow. I think it's working. Uh, you can stay after class and hand proofread it if you want. I think it's working. So, okay, look, my point isn't that that one is hard. That one's not supposed to take us very long. But I did want to point out that we used a loop here. So, like, were we cheating? Well, I think this is okay because I'm just in new, I'm not looping over all the digits with this loop. I'm not using the loop to get out of the recursion part, okay? I'm only using the loop to enumerate all the possible single choices that my call might choose to make. And, I mean, look, I could use that up here, too. I could use a for loop from 0 to 1, but that kind of seems silly. So for this one, there were few enough <laughs> cases, I just wrote them out. But down here, since there were 10, I used a loop for them. So sometimes when we're solving these problems, I'll say, like, hey, you could use a loop if you want, but you have to use recursion for the self-similar parts of the problem. So what I'm trying to say, if I, if I tell you something like that on an assignment or a test, what I mean is that you could probably use some kind of little loop like this to queue up your, your calls that you're going to make, but not a loop to solve the overall uh, problem and avoid the recursion part. You know? So anyway, that's print decimal, basically the same idea. And the only reason I showed it was to show that sometimes loops are okay in this context, okay? Uh, let's play some more. Okay. Let's do permutations. Permutations means just rearranging all the letters of a string into all the possible orders. So if you permute the word Marty, you get all these. Um, somewhere in there is my rat, my rat. <laughs> uh, I guess if you take my full name, Marty Step, and you rearrange it, you get sperm patty. <laughs> I think they sell those at our lager. I don't know. I'm not sure. Um, oh, it was a deep cut. Uh, anyway, gross. So uh, rearrange all the letters of the word to all the different uh, possible orderings, right? So this feels like a similar kind of a problem to um, the, the last two. Print all the things, you know? Print all the different ways you can do the thing. That's kind of an exhaustive search of all the arrangements of this string, right? Okay, but you know, I kind of gave you this algorithm strategy or, or, or pattern, like you sort of think about decisions and choices and what you could choose. So like, what is the unit of choosing stuff for this problem? How much should one call do? Yes? A character, a letter, so like maybe I pick that the M should go first, or maybe I should pick that the Y goes over here, like pick what to do with one letter. Okay, I think that sounds good. Somebody else was talking, was that what you were saying too? Yeah? Um, okay. Well, how do we do that? Um, if I go to Qt Creator, oh, I have a different file to open now. Um, let me call this main 0001, whatever. Okay. Um, and now I'm going to open permute. Uh, so here, I have permute string s. Print all the possible rearrangements of a given string. OK. So I mean, just picture the general pattern, like make a choice and explore. And if there aren't any more choices to make, then I'm done, and that kind of stuff. So um, how, do I, how do I do some of that? Here, like what, what kind of choices? How do I make a choice? I don't know. Help me out with a little bit here. What would you do next? <coughs> take the first, take the first letter. Yeah. So like care. Okay, so like so kind of cut that letter out of the. Like loop in the letters of the string and pick each one of them for the first place of all permutations, and then remove it from the string and pass the rest of the string to the recursive function. Got it. Okay, so. Each of the letters, so like if we're talking about the string Marty, I'm kind of self-centered, I pick my name for the example. So you're saying for each of these letters, like I think the way to think of each call stacking up is each of them is picking what letter goes next. So like this guy first is gonna pick which of these five should go first in the output. 
maybe it picks the M or maybe it picks the T or whatever, but we sort of pick that and now we pick all the four letter things that could follow that, kind of, right? So you said just, I need to loop over it and like an example, of, if I were gonna pick out the M and then make the recursion do the rest, it would be like pluck zero out and then do, you know, uh, string S2 equals S dot substr of one, like start at one and then do permute on S2, some, something kind of vaguely like that. But you're saying that's only gonna print strings that have M as the first letter. I wanna do that, then I wanna print all the strings that have A as the first letter. So like that piece of code would be followed kind of vaguely by something like S1, and then it would be like S substring 01 followed by S dot sub, oops, what is that, sub sir. <laughs> to, you know, something like that, chop letter one out, and then, so you'd be doing like that kind of thing for each of the five letters, but you said use a loop, right? Because these chunks will be exactly the same, and the number of these terms are gonna be kind of related to the length of, of S, so yeah. I think, I think that's a good idea. So something like for each in I equals zero, I is less than S dot length, I plus plus, you're saying pick character I, and then go to i, but not including i, and then start at i plus one for the rest, so we, everything but character i there, and then permute the rest, sort of. Is that kind of the right idea? Yeah, no, no, that's almost entirely right. You said, you said this keeps going, each time we do the recursive call, the, the string that we pass is shorter, right? Yeah, yeah, so exactly. Um, this string is getting shorter. You said a second ago that this whole process is gonna stop doing this when there's nothing left in S2, when S2 has been all chewed up, right? So uh, I think what you're saying is, like, my S2 is gonna be the next guy's S. So, like, if S dot length is zero, that's like a base case, so we don't quite have that code yet, but otherwise, we will sort of, like, pick the next letter, or I guess I would say choose the next letter to be part of the string that we're building, okay? And then what was the last thing that you said, which I think was also a good suggestion? Um, we should also have the prefix that in the base case we want to print it. And the prefix would mean that each time that, that we use the first letter, we're actually adding to the end of the prefix. Yeah, I think the trick from the binary problem about passing along a prefix or something is also a trick that would work here. Um, I mean, look, it's not always a string, but somehow you need to be keeping track of the choices that your calls are making, and you need to be handing those choices to the next call, so the next call can see them, or add to them, or print them, or whatever the call is going to need to do. In this case, I think it's just supposed to print all of them, so I think we just need to be building these strings. Yeah, so, so I think um, uh, you said pass like a string prefix. That sounds fine. So what if I go here and I... I write uh, string prefix, maybe initially it's nothing like before. Okay, so now here, if I get to length of zero, that means that, oh, well, actually, I, I'm not using the prefix yet, right? So um, permute of S2, I have to pass a prefix for him, right? So what do I pass here? First, yeah, I guess it's not really the first character, is it? I'll call it ch, like this character. Right, so so pluck out a character, slice the string out, slice him out of the string, and now call permute with the smaller string, but with this guy chosen to be next, basically. Okay, so if I get to a length of zero, what does that mean? It's a base case, right? But how, how do I get here? What does it mean if my code gets here? Yeah? There are no choices left. Yeah, I think you both said the same, which is that uh, the prefix has been built up to contain every character from S, and S has been shriveled down to nothing left in S. S should be empty, and prefix should be full. So that means we've picked a permutation, right? So let's print it. C out, prefix, end all. Uh, let's try it. Permute, Marty. And ooh, look, it 
It's printing all the different strings. Now, you might say, well, what's the ordering here? Why does it print them in this order? I mean, basically the way of thinking of it is it picks M first, and then it prints all the strings that could start with an M. Why does it pick M first? Because M happened to be character zero in the string originally that was passed in. It just picks the first one first and tries that. So it prints all the strings that start with M's. And if you look carefully, what does it pick next? Well, the next one in the original string was A, so it prints all the strings that start with MA. The next one with the string, original string was R, so it prints all the ones that start with MR. The next one in the original string was T, so it prints all the ones that start with MT. The next one in the original string was Y, so it prints all the ones that start with MY. And then once it's done with that, it's tried all the different second characters that could follow M. So then it goes back and the M part is done. And now it starts printing all the words that, that start with, uh, with A's. So that's, it looks like it's working. Uh, here, let's try a different name. Uh, whose name should I use? How about Cynthia? She's my buddy. So let's print that one. Whoa, there's a whole bunch of... You can see the output just dumping, dumping out. Uh, how, many, how many lines of output are there? Look at all the National Merit Scholars. 5041. I'm using Python as a calculator. <laughs> 5040. Oh, the first line is the heading. <laughs> I think there might be something to that. You know why, right? It's like first guy gets seven different ones to pick and then he plucks that one out and then all the next ones, there's six left for them to pick. It's vector. So yeah, something like that. Um, okay, anyway, that is permutations. Um, what if, oh, there's a question. Yeah, go ahead. Yes, so why is this substring a function that everyone counts? Why is this substring i Oh, well, the substring function, it has this property where if you, if you start it or end it at the very end of the string, like if the length is 10 and you pass it an index of 10, it only breaks if you ask for an actual character that's out of bounds. So if you say, hey, string of length 10, give me all the letters starting at 10, it gives you an empty string back. But if you were to ask for 11 or something, I think it would, it would crash. It, it's just this special exception that if you're at the very end and you say, give me everything starting from here, it's like, oh, you mean, all the nothing at the end of the string, and it gives you back the nothing. So it works out. I mean, luckily for us, I mean, we'd have to put a bunch of darn ifs in here to check otherwise, which would be kind of a pain. But yeah, it works out. Um, okay, so like slight variation of this real quick. What if instead of printing all the permutations, I want you to return or give me all the permutations out, like in a vector or something? Hmm. What's that, yeah? Sure, okay, instead of printing it, insert it in a vector. I think that's a great idea. The vector should be sent by reference to the Yeah, yeah, so I think if you imagine for a second that we could totally just cheat and do bad style stuff, you know, then like what I would do is I would just go up here somewhere, I'd include vector, that's not bad style, I can do that, but, but, but like what if I just said like lol vector of string v, you know, lol global variable, don't do this, whatever, right? So I have a global variable, which is bad, right? But then down here in permute, what you said was instead of printing it, just do like v dot add prefix. I just throw it in the vector, magic global vector. And now up here, uh, after I call permute, instead of permuting Cynthia, maybe I'll do like a, a Abby or something, that's my dog. Um, and then I would just do like C out V endl, and then ta-da, it prints all that. Now some of them are duplicated because there's multiple Bs. I don't care about that. That's fine. That's okay. But I mean, there, I got them as a vector. That works, but that's not very good style, right? I, you know, when we were going to get our dog, I was like, hmm, it's funny how my wife wants to name the dog something that's an anagram for baby. Hmm. It's like before we agreed we were going to have a kid, you know? It's like, I see what you're doing there. Um, it worked, too. Uh, so, okay, I mean, that is a way to put the results in a vector, but 
you had a better, I think, style of a solution where I don't want this global variable. What I really want is something like, you know, vector of strings uh, v equals permute, and then I print. So, you know, I don't want this vector like floating out here like that. Okay? So, I mean, could you say again what you were suggesting before? Yeah, that's a good idea. I mean, so uh, sometimes when we want to have a collection that we manipulate, we pass it along by reference. And I think that's the right idea because I think, you know, you could picture here, like I could make a vector and I could put stuff in it and I could return it, but that sounds kind of icky, doesn't it? I'm going to call the next guy and he returns a vector and I have to combine it with my vector. It sounds kind of icky. So I think a better approach would be for this function to sort of make a vector and then all the calls could sort of share it and pass it around to each other and look at it. And then when they're all done filling it with data, then we could return it out to main, basically. Now, we learned about static variables. So you might make a static vector, but I don't like that because um, that vector will live on after the recursive call is done in a way that I don't want. So I don't think I want to use a static vector. So what you said I think is a great idea, which is um, let's make a vector that we pass along by reference. Now, you might say, okay, well, maybe maybe what you want is like vector v and then I permute abby comma v and then it like puts everything into v. But I want to challenge you, like if I really do want it to look like that, somebody has to make this vector and pass it around so it gets filled with data. So here's my suggestion. I think sometimes when there's a mismatch between the parameters that, that uh, the main wants and the parameters that we need for our recursion, sometimes we just make another function that bridges the gap between those two things. So I think you should do something like the following. If you want to do permute, then what I'll really do is I'll have some kind of other function called like void permute helper that takes string s, string prefix, and vector of strings v. Oh, I guess it's a reference to, as you said, reference, so they share it. And now the actual permute function, when you call it, it'll say, I want to create a vector of strings v, and then I want to call permute helper s comma prefix comma v and then I want to return v. So like I make it, I pass it along, I return it out. Um, I have to make a prototype for this so it'll compile, but that's the idea, yeah. So uh, is it possible, uh, instead of that, is it possible to use one function and then use a default value? Oh, use a default, just say vector equals empty yeah. or whatever? Um, possible, but I don't know if it works as well for references, you know, like I think that works better if it's passed by value. Um, I don't know, it might be that you could get it to work. I'm also, I want to remind you that like I'm trying to teach you strategies that would work for all the programming languages. Not every language has reference parameters, not every language has default values. Every language you can do this sort of stuff. Like if you're doing this problem in Java, you often have to write it this way. There's kind of no way uh, around it. Yeah, go, go ahead. Yeah, so also, uh, like before you're saying this is better than the Oh, when is it ever good? When I explicitly want the vector to live on here after this and be reusable by this function later. So like memoizing an hour from now, if you call this again, the results from an hour ago are still helpful. In this case, the vector you needed an hour ago, you're done with it and it has no relevance to the new vector that you're computing to this moment. Uh, yeah. Sure. Yeah. Uh, seeing as functions are first class uh, values in C++, would it be possible to say like store the permute helper function inside the scope of permute to avoid polluting global namespace and then just like run it from there? Oh, like declaring it in a scope. I mean, there's there's lots of things you can do. I think, I mean, again, like I think this is the way to do it that is the most language agnostic. Is if there's two functions and one of them is the parameters you need to have for the problem statement and the other one is the parameters you need to solve the problem you often write two functions and you have the one call the other one. And there's definitely some times that you can get away with some sort of merger between those two things that maybe embraces some of C++'s features. But frankly, I don't even like C++ very much. Or it's dumb with features. Uh, so, no, I'm just kidding. But uh, I, you know, this is the way that you, generally speaking, do this, you know? So, like, you make the vector, you pass it along, you return it. Um, one thing I need to fix is that since this guy is doing the real work, these calls down here need to call permute helper instead of permute, so it'll actually do the, the work. Uh, and Oh, and I have to pass um, v. The only time anything gets added to v is here where it would have been printed. So if I compile this, oops, conversion from, oh yeah, yeah, this one's supposed to return vector of strings. So I think I need to fix my, my prototype up here to be that. Uh, 
Yeah, in fact, the other thing I can do is I can take the prefix out of here because the only person who really needs the prefix is the helper. So I mean, sometimes you kind of clean this up a little bit. So let me come back here. So permute with no prefix. So I pass S and, and uh, empty string and V. So yeah, now I think I need this heading to be above this so it can see it with semicolon in there. I think I'm good now. No, no, no. There. How about that? Ah, V declared as referencing. Sorry. <laughs> uh, copy, paste. Okay, I think I'm good now. Uh, yes, now it works. But I just want to point out, like, that's an example where instead of printing all the things, I want to capture into a collection all of the things. There's a few little tricks you have to do. You have to make the collection, you have to pass it along by reference, you have to put things in it. When you're done, you have to emit it out either by reference or by return. So you have to think about all those things if you're going to gather them. And so printing is great because printing just sort of sends it off to the console. It just escapes out of this function, out to the world where the user can see it, you know? But if I want to keep it and get it back to some other part of the code, that can be a little bit trickier. So that's what I was doing here. Okay, questions about that one? And again, I want to remind you that you often will need something like this, where I tell you you have to write this function. And you're like, I can't do it. I need five more parameters. Okay, fine. Write your own function with five more parameters and have this one call it and now you're fine. Just, just you know, you, because you have to write this doesn't mean you aren't allowed to write this. You know, that's important. Okay. Okay, let's go back. Let's go back. So what else, what else, what else? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we already talked about this problem. Um, okay, permute. I think we might have time for this. Um, variation on permutations. This is combinations that are just unique substrings of a given string with a given number of letters. It's a pretty similar problem. Pretty similar problem. I, I want to print them now. I don't want to um, store them in a, in a vector or whatever. But notice how there's duplicates like uh, Google, G-O-O-G-L-E. Like I don't want to print L-G-O twice because there's two G's or whatever. You know what I mean? Print all the unique three-letter orderings of any three letters from this string. Any just general thoughts, like how I would approach this, how I would attack this? What do you think? Just make a new string that has only unique letters of the original string and call the same function. Oh, that's interesting. I could just sweep through it and snip out all the duplicates. Yeah, I could do that. That wasn't what I was thinking of. But, um, and then just permute the string. Yeah. So I would do O-G-L-E, yeah. comma, three. Um, but what about the three aspect, though? What about, I don't want all the letters. I only want three, right? So I still have to do that. <coughs> Somebody else's hand is Let me get a new person. Yeah. Um, well, I just like to point out that you did that solution to do strings like goo. Oh, we don't want this. Never mind. Did I lose goo? Is there supposed to be goo in here? No, I mean, it says that can be formed from unique letters. Oh, OK, never mind. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's different ways you could do this, right? You could write a version that would print goo. Oh, go. But whatever you do, you don't want two versions of goo, one with the first O followed by the second O, and one with the second O followed by the first O. I don't, neither one of those problems is better or worse to solve than the other. But what about this general notion of like not printing duplicate things? Yeah. Maybe you can pass around a vector of your solutions and just before printing check to see if you've already found that solution. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think if, if you want the sort of simplest change from the permutation problem to this problem, the way you can do it with the least typing, I think, is to copy paste the permutation code, but take all the strings that you print and save them into like a, a, a set. And then if you have seen the string before, don't print it again, basically. So something like this. Uh, I, I think just for time, because I only got a minute or two, I think what I'm going to do just as a hack is I'm going to change this function to be a combination function, and I'm not going to bother to name it properly. So I'm going to go up here and, and write Google. But down here, I guess what I'm going to do is, uh, as I add to a vector, I'm going to do C out prefix endl. So the key thing here, if you imagine for a second that I had the cheating and I had a set of strings called uh, already printed, you know, if I could cheat, like uh, I've got set.h here. I've got a set called already printed. Then I think what you would do is like as you print stuff, you would say 
already printed dot add this prefix, right? But what you would do is before you printed it, you would say if the already printed doesn't contain this, then print it and add it to the set. Uh, yeah. Sure, so I mean, you could add it to the set and then print the set, that would also be fine. The thing that this code doesn't do is handle the length aspect, permutations of length three or whatever. So I think what the current code is doing is it's avoiding printing two copies of the same string. Uh, last thing before we go home, yeah. Um, so I was saying that you can take a string that has all the unique letters of the string and then you could recursively find all substrings of that string which are length k and call permute helper of that. Sure. I tell you what, let's explore both of those solutions on Wednesday. I gotta let you go though. So uh, have a wonderful day and I will see you back next time. <laughs>